This is MuggleCast, the Harry Potter podcast discussing everything about J.K. Rowling's wizarding world. This week's episode is sponsored by Harry's, who offer a great shave at a fair price. Get $5 off a shave set when you go to harrys.com slash MuggleCast. Welcome to MuggleCast episode 323. I'm Andrew. I'm Eric. I'm Micah. And joining us this week is one of our Slug Club members, Juliana. Welcome to the show, Juliana. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, it's great to have you on. Uh, You know, everybody, it's 13 years to the day since Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban hit theaters. We're recording on Sunday, June 4th. Love it. It was the first Harry Potter movie to come out during the summer. Movies 1 and 2 came out in November. I uh, I still remember going to this movie. Oh, me too. <laughs> Sitting there. <laughs> I actually have a very specific memory of the Shrieking Shack scene, watching all these iconic actors and characters all together. I still remember leaning forward in my seat because I was like, oh, look at all these people in one scene. This is amazing. <laughs> that's just the, that's the one memory. And I still remember who I went with. It was one of my friends from... Uh, middle school, I guess it was. Do you guys remember going to it? Did you go to like a midnight screening or? I have no memory of seeing this movie in theaters. I know I did, and it must have been opening weekend, but I don't remember it at all. Hmm. I did not go see it in uh, theaters. I saw it after the fact. Huh. Oh, okay. Fake fan. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I s- I don't I don't want to like pull rank here. I saw it in London at the Odeon Leicester Square. Um, during this was actually the apex moment of hp fan trips of the very first Eric, hp fan trips us all to shame i i didn't mean to do that i mean if you had <laughs> even seen it in theaters you could compete but uh, <laughs> no no it was it was a blast moment i remember it vividly because this was the day 13 years ago that i that i found out what wolf star was or was it moon star wolf star it's a serious and remus ship uh i was uh. Sit, i was sitting next to the world's largest wolf star shipper uh, and she also happened to be my chaperone on the trip, a woman by the name of Catherine, uh, who, because I was, st- I was still 16 and couldn't go on the trip on my own. Uh, so she was chaperoning. Anyway, the Shrieking Shack scene, too, when um, Sirius, or just after when Sirius is, is having to uh, hold Remus very closely and try and prevent him from transforming uh, mm. and saying, you live in one, this is your heart, your real heart, it's true, mm. and he's holding his chest, and Catherine was just flipping out, just absolutely <laughs> losing it. And I remember looking next to her and seeing her glee and just being completely moved and empathically just, like, blown away by how great uh, this movie was having an effect on on, on her because, ultimately, uh, I, I came out of it not uh, appreciating the adaptation as a whole, but um, it was great. That seeing was probably it. one of the strongest adult ships in the Harry Potter fandom. I, I would like actually, adult character ships. I, I, I still think it's probably the most closest to canon, honestly, if you really look at it, you know, objectively. But I, I think that um, the I mean, the film definitely pleased those fans. But uh, the cool thing about the theater was it was still decked out because the world premiere had been like the previous weekend, and we didn't. I didn't see the world premiere, but the the building had Dementors coming out of it. Like, uh, like Ooh. very, very large sort of Dementor arms. Uh, and then like the side of the building was painted for obviously like the trio up top. It was really, really cool. I have a picture somewhere. Um, but cool. yeah, and this was 2004. Prisoner of Azkaban was obviously one of the more controversial films looking back on what film was the greatest of the series. A lot of people say it's their favorite, whereas a lot of people say it's their least favorite. Mm-hmm. Alfonso Cuaron really brought a different vibe. He, he, he. He made Harry Potter grow up. He, yeah. The, one of the biggest and kind of most controversial changes is that he took them out of the cloaks. They were always wearing cloaks in the first two movies, looking like little kids, and then they he started putting them in just kids' clothing. Yeah. Um, so that was a big change. Of course, the, the shrunken head, that was an Alf- Alfonso touch. That wasn't in the book. Um, but yeah, I, I, like, I like the movie a lot, looking back on it. Not... Not one of my favorite books, but that's besides the point. We're talking about the movie. <laughs> Speaking anyway, of favorite books. <laughs> yeah. So, Juliana, let's hear about – let's get your fandom ID. What is your favorite – or what is your Hogwarts house? I say that every time. Uh, Ravenclaw. How about Ilvermorny House? Horn Serpent. Ooh. 
favorite book? Um, I don't know. It always changes. I've for a long time said Order of the Phoenix, mostly just because it's the longest one. And I like all the backstory that they get into with the Weasley twins and um, all that kind of thing. But I also really like the third one. So I okay. I would go with Order of the Phoenix, but it's not a definite. How about favorite character? Um, Hermione. Ooh. Aw. Uh, Patronus from Pottermore? Uh, it's an otter, which is the same as Hermione's, which made me Aww. very happy. <laughs> yeah, I bet. And finally, how did, how did you get into Harry Potter? Um, so I was introduced to it by my third grade teacher. She would read to the class every day and she read the first Harry Potter book. Um, and I'm assuming I went home and begged my mom to buy them for me. And that was right <laughs> after the third book came out. And it's funny because when she bought them for me, she bought them out of order. So I read the first book, then I read the third one, and was very confused. <gasps> and then went and read Chamber <laughs> of Secrets. <laughs> Wait, were you aware that the when you read Prisoner of Azkaban that you were skipping a book, or did you not even realize that? I didn't even realize it. And then in the beginning of Prisoner of Azkaban, they talk about how Ron broke his wand. Mm. And I remember reading that and, and saying to myself, like, I don't remember this happening <laughs> oh my at, gosh. at the end of the book. And then I think we, we realized that uh, we made a mistake there. Well, oh, that is too funny. Actually, you know what? Alfonso Cuaron did the same thing, and that explains a lot about the third movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe that's why. <laughs> well, thanks again for joining us. It's great to have you here. We're going, that's great to be we're here. going to be talking about Credence Barebone today as we get towards the uh, end of our character discussion marathon. And we also have some voicemails later in the show. But first, one news item this week. I am so thrilled about this, you guys. Um, The Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone 20th Anniversary House Editions are now out in the UK and in Canada. They are freaking gorgeous. Gorgeous. So we've spoken about them previously when they were announced. There's, There's four editions now of Philosopher's Stone, each representing one Hogwarts house. And on the cover... You get your house colors, you get your house crest, and then you get a couple of words describing your house. And then uh, the pages, the the outside of the pages, I still don't know what word to use to you, to describe them. They're, they're <laughs> colored. They have the, your house colors. So um, at Hypable, I had Danya, one of our writers. She also appears on Resistance Radio from time to time with Eric, mm-hmm. a Star Wars podcast. Yeah, Danya's great. Yeah, um, she ran out and picked up Hufflepuffs because she is a Hufflepuff, and she took pictures and wrote a review on Hypable. And these, the book just looks so amazing because, in addition to the Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone story itself, you also get house exclusive content. You get to learn about the house ghost. You get to learn about the house founder. You get to learn about. Um, there's a there's a page here called Making Hufflepuffs Proud. <laughs> uh, Who wrote that? It also comes. Is it all from J.K. I don't know. Good question. Uh, but there's also a map of Hogwarts School. It's just like, I mean, and the picture of of Helga Hufflepuff in this book is just stunning. She's hot. yeah. I'm so excited to get this book. <laughs> I I love the I love the deep dive on on this book in particular as a Hufflepuff. I love this. So now I have to own this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, previously we said that, well, that I was ordering, did you guys order copies I did. from no. Amazon UK? Oh, I didn't. Okay. I did. Did, did yours ship yeah. both of you? Good. Yeah, it's on its Excellent. way. Excellent. Uh, I think by mid, mid June, we should have them in America. For those wondering why they're not selling them here in America, it's technically not Trump. the 20th anniversary here, yes, Trump has prevented this yeah. book from <laughs> being published here. No, this is actually the 19th anniversary in America, so it'll be interesting to see what Scholastic does. I think they'd be crazy not to do house editions because these just seem to be wildly popular in the UK so far. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's also kind of like I don't. I guess maybe I'm just an impatient person, but. <laughs> Who can wait till next year to get one of these books? I want it now. So that's well, why it I simulates it. the pain of waiting for the book to come out in the U.S. <laughs> and wait, uh, which ones yes, did you yes. get? Did you get all of them, Andrew? No. So I got Slytherin and Gryffindor, but apparently I ordered two Gryffindors, which I honestly don't remember doing. Mm. So I'm gonna. So yeah. So I'm gonna have both of. Both we are of doing houses. a giveaway, right? At some point. 
We yes, did. You are. We did. And we already have the winners and their book shipped too. Oh, oh okay. love it. Otherwise, I was going to say, Eric, yeah. that's a great idea. <laughs> that, that was, hey, good ideas was, are always good. <laughs> that was last month's Patreon giveaway, or two months ago, I think. Yeah, yeah, we'll figure hey, out what uh, what this coming month. But will I be. went. But this with, is this uh, is super cool. Slytherin and Ravenclaw. Oh, you got two. Did, yeah. Why? Why two? Well, you were the hat stall, right? Hat stall. Yeah. Ah, uh, yeah. How about you, Juliana? I just got the Ravenclaw one. Oh, duh, of course. Uh, cool. I'm gonna get the Hufflepuff one. Yeah. So good stuff. Really glad that these are happening and we'll talk about them probably not next episode we'll have them but the episode after that we should have them yeah once they've all been received we are going to get into our discussion about credence credence in a moment but first just want to tell everybody that this week's episode is brought to you by harry's father's day is just around the corner and dads are impossible to shop for (laughs) <laughs> because it could be hard to find something that feels special that he'll actually use. I know my dad, he's so darn picky with, with, with gifts. It's so annoying. Yeah. Um, but fortunately, our friends over at Harry's have a special offer that you're going to love, and dad will too. You can get $5 off one of their shave sets, including a limited edition Father's Day set at harrys.com slash mugglecast. Eric, Micah, and I, we all love using Harry's. I'm the newest person in this group, I think, to start using them. I love the shaving cream that they give you. It's very easy to apply and wash off and helps you achieve a close and comfortable shave. And I mentioned Father's Day. Harry sent me two Father's Day sets. I love it. And I gave the second one to my dad. And we both love them because I mean, I'm not a dad, by the way, but we both love them. I was going to say, because... <laughs> treat yourself. <laughs> right. <laughs> Guys, I have an announcement. Yeah. <laughs> no, um, they, they, they come in these beautiful boxes. So it's, it's more than just giving your dad a razor and some shaving cream. It comes in this beautiful presentation, I, and I think he'll, he'll really like it. And like I said, it's something he can actually use. So go to harrys.com slash mugglecast right now to redeem a special offer for fans of the show. Harry's is going to give you $5 off one of their shave sets, any of them. This is for a limited time only, so act now. That's harrys.com slash mugglecast to get $5 off and help support the show. I shaved with a Harry's razor this morning. I need to tonight. Well, there we go. <laughs> uh, all right, so let's get into our character discussion. Yay! Today we're going to be talking about Credence Barebone, played by Ezra Miller in Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them. The uh, interesting thing about the trajectory of our character discussions is going from Grindelwald or going from Graves into Credence uh, is sort of, well, positively inspired. The two characters probably share the closest, you know, and most screen time when they're with each other in the film. Um, But if you really think about it, Credence is, in some ways, the most powerful magical force possibly in existence at the time of Fantastic Beasts. Because you're going into, you know, Grindelwald seeking out this Obscurus who's going to um, help him, you know, to take over for wizards and all that. But Credence being much older, uh, you know, people don't usually survive to the age where Credence is. If they have an Obscurus, Credence has done that. And so Credence, somehow, something about him, and this is said in the movie a bunch of times, makes him super powerful and kind of terrifying. Yeah, he's the most disturbed character. Um, He's the most vulnerable character. And you see that vulnerability towards the end where he gets really mad Mm -hmm. at Graves slash Grindelwald and starts wreaking havoc. In in terms of how he ranks in Fantastic Beasts as a character. How would you guys... Did you like him a lot? Did you really not like him? Personally, because he's so dark and depressed, he wasn't one of my favorite characters. (laughs) He's a bit mopey, but I think you get uh, the reveal at the end gives you a little bit more of reasoning as to why he is the way that he is throughout the course of the film. Right. Sure. So it's you may not. It, it, I don't want to put it in the same category as somebody like Tina, but you 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 get a better understanding as to why he acts the way that he does throughout the course of the film. And and you mentioned vulnerability. Uh, Graves slash Grindelwald plays upon that masterfully throughout the course of the film and is able to really uh, take advantage of his emotions and 
it's it's hard to watch. Uh, but then when you get that reveal uh, at the end, and, and I would throw out the question to the group, did you see that coming? Did you think it was his sister that was the Obscurious, or did you kind of have a thought in the back of your mind that it was going to be Credence? I, I think I can recall genuinely being surprised by the reveal because yeah. you're, you're going into the movie for the first time and everyone, including Newt Scamander, who's the expert, is saying that it's going to be a young child. And Grindelwald is talking with Credence and says, you got to find this young child. Everyone's looking for him. And the movie is shot, you know, up until the very end when Graves is approaching um, the little girl in the corner and she looks just utterly terrified and he realizes that and you realize that she's not in control of it. I don't know. It, it's just so well played. I think it was I, I think I can remember being genuinely hoodwinked by that. And the other surprise was that Grindelwald Graves didn't even see that he was the Obscurus. Right. So that's why we were all so surprised as well, because it's like, why didn't Grindelwald realize it himself? He calls him a yeah. squib, right? He said he could smell it. Oh, oh yo, God. Yeah. When he gets mad at him, right? Yeah, that's such a, a dirty line. I hate that. Um, J.K. Rowling describes it, uh, describes Credence in the Blu-ray special features. Uh, she says, Credence is Mary Lou's adopted son. He is a traumatized young man. And I think that's... That's a good word for it. I mean, he's he's traumatized. Mary Lou Barebones, the head of the Second Salemers, who I believe we'll be talking about next week, um, you know, is really just keeps this group of people and is condemning magic. And she sort of creates this environment where he isn't free to explore who he is or what he is, but he somehow feels this responsibility uh, to, to keep order to keep these children, I guess, safe off the streets, whatever it is that they're doing ex- exactly there. Um, you know, he's he's the oldest and therefore the most responsible. He's in charge of going out and finding meeting places, uh, these other things that we see him do in the films. But ultimately, it's it's a life of repression and oppression. He's, he's just not able to be himself. And that's J.K. Rowling, I guess, thesis statement, really, across all Harry Potter films is you got to be yourself. And and Mary and Mary Lou hates him the most of all of her children. Yeah, do you think she because, knows? Well, yeah, that's what I was wondering too. I would, th- I assume you mean knows that she he's a wizard yeah. has magical mm. abilities. He she knew that his birth mother was a witch. Yeah. So I think she assumes that he could be. Then again, she probably doesn't know much about magic and how it works. So maybe she doesn't realize the extent of his abilities. Uh, but she must have a feeling. She must have a feeling. And this this is, I think, why he he was treated the worst amongst the children. Yeah. So It makes me wonder how old Credence was when she adopted him. Like, was he, did he, was he already like this Obscurus or did she, is she the reason that he is an Obscurus? That's what I really want to know. <laughs> yeah. I would guess that she's a big reason why that he's an Obscurus because, because you become an obscurus by suppressing it, right? So yeah, right. I, so if if she hates magic, he's going to be suppressing it, and it's just going to get worse and worse. Mm-hmm. That's true. Which means she would have had to have adopted him when he was still in those like formative years of magic. Very young. Um, I would, I yeah. would think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think that she is in large part why uh, he is an obscurus, and and so one other question though is is what do you think his last name? could be do you think that he's from a very powerful magical family are you in in terms Mm. of future films is this something that's going to be revealed yeah i think he's probably going to be related to some a familiar family a very powerful very interesting the grindelwald family (laughs) (laughs) i am your cousin or the the gaunts or something yeah i i yeah i don't know i wonder I wonder about that. We actually have a lot of uh, – we have some info on Barebone, but that could be his adopted name, as you point out. Um, but our good friend Katie uh, delivered with name origins, which I think we should probably uh, talk about towards the end of the discussion because actually it's, it's – it, it's, I don't think it's best suited there. Um, but, uh, but yeah, Credence as a, a character who is being repressed, I, I have to say – I think that his character arc in future films, because there's a case to be made for him still being around. I think David Yates 
very early on spoiled that uh, he would in fact be coming back. I I, I like the idea of of Credence who is sort of in a tough position but overcomes that. And the reason I led with his magical ability, you know, talking about how he is the most powerful force is because I think he'll be very useful um, to Newt and his friends uh, or at least a force to be reckoned with in future. And I, I have a feeling that his character, given time, is going to come around to, you know, the side of good, I think, more so than the side of bad. I just don't think th- that enough has been done to him that would make him, like, against humanity. Although, yeah. in this film, he straight up kills a dude. Like, the Shaw, the Shaw <laughs> banquet. I mean, if you if you look at that scene and how terrifying it is, it's almost like it's in a different movie, a horror movie, because quite unseen, he just bowls through the banquet hall and re- tear, like tears Shaw uh, right up, you know, lifts him up, kills him, and leaves him for dead, and then, you know, But the out. reason... F- for that was justified because there's that earlier scene where they're where they're in the newspaper office and yeah. his family's being treated like crap. Yeah. So I think that was that that justifies his rampage yeah, well, I, at the event. I think it's interesting you say his family was being treated like crap because I don't mm. particularly think that it mattered the way that his mother or his adopted mother was being treated by the Shaws. Mm. I think it was more so, uh, I think Shaw straight up calls him a freak uh, in the yeah. office, mm. and I completely forgot mm-hmm. about that the first time that I watched the film. I think going back and watching it again and having the context of him being the Obscurus yeah. is much, much different, and you see his facial reactions and how he's responding to things, and not only does he kill Shaw, he kills his sister um, by accident when he kills uh, his his adopted mother, so... Yeah. How much yeah. does he have the ability to really control what's going on? And you talked about him becoming a force for good, but how? Because if he's not able to control this, and and there's sort of this uh, additional effect that that can happen when when he is is taking on this form that he can't really do much about, that's very dangerous. I I think I mean when I'm saying like force for good i think what it is is he 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 might not have the ability right now to control it uh aside from the fact that he can turn it on and off and he seemed to be i don't know he seemed to be having pretty good composure in the train station at the end when when newt was was talking to him i i just think that because newt is the expert uh and was able to actually separate he did he does the impossible was able to separate on a younger person you know, the obscurus, the obscurial from the person. Um, and I, I'm not suggesting that's what he's going to do with Credence because maybe it's just too late and you can't. But I think Credence and Newt could really work together and form sort of like a friendship, which is only like hinted at here. Maybe that's crazy. Yeah. But well, no, I think yeah. an important thing to remember is that Graves promised, Graves Grindelwald promised him that he would have a place in the wizarding world. He could get him into the wizarding world. Right. And Graves really, or sorry, Credence really wanted that. And I think one of the reasons for the outrage, his, his outrage in the movie was that he realized that, um, Grindelwald Graves was lying to him. So I think now he's driven to truly become a wizard. Now his mom is out of the way who, who was causing major disruptions in his life. Yeah. Now I think, what could make him good is this, this desire to be a regular wizard, to be open about who he is. Yeah. And to be loved. We know he wants love, too. Yeah. Because he was he was getting close to, to Graves because Graves was showing him attention. And he was like, it's okay what you are. You don't have to be afraid of what you are. I wonder, though. I will also, help you. With mm-hmm. this, simula- this situation potentially being very similar to what happened to Ariana... If Credence is in fact traveling to where Newt is traveling, could we see Dumbledore even adopt Credence in a sense and and try and and bring about what you guys are talking about, you know, making him whole again? I I love that idea. I didn't even I don't I didn't even think of that. Like having Dumbledore. Yes, it's on the table. I think it's absolutely on the table. Mm. Um, Do you think he'd be able to like? Do you think he'd be able to like rein in his powers enough to function as a normal wizard? He does. Yeah. Because he does seem kind of out of control. 
Although his his force is definitely like pointed because he doesn't kill lots of random people. Like when he's destroying things in New York that you see in the beginning of the film, he seems to only kill people with intention. So he has some level of control. That's a good question as to whether or not he could even wield a wand and do normal spells now that he's an obscurial. With training, with love, with having friends. Well, the answer to everything is love. Right. Of course it is. Yeah, I'd, right. I'd like so to see that. I'm sure that, that would work. Uh, I would. I, I think. I think what it is, though, and and you know, you mentioned this too, Micah. Like, getting being so turned off by Graves in the in the movie, right? He knows he was sort of just being used. Automatically puts him on the right side of the war, because this is going to be Grindelwald's war, and Grindelwald, you know, he sees how Grindelwald manipulated him. Um, so I, I just see him as as uh, definitely going to be on on sort of the same side. But as like a rogue agent, almost because his power is unmatched. Right. Nobody's ever lived to to this uh, age while still being an obscurus. It's crazy. And he does have it under control to an extent, but again, yeah. you know, chastity was really an unintended casualty of what happened when he completely destroyed the church and, and killed his stepmom. So yeah. there is still that mm-hmm. unintended effect that could happen and, and has happened already. So I think it's going to take a lot of training, a lot of trying to teach him to control this to a point where he's not having these unintended consequences uh, hurt other people. And so I don't know if that means completely removing the obscurial from him and then training mm-hmm. him, or it may be an impossibility just given how old he is at this point. I think there's so many things that could uh, be discussed as it relates to that. Yeah. Maybe he'll go to Hogwarts, and that's when we'll see Hogwarts again. <laughs> We're going to see Hogwarts again anyway, because <laughs> uh, the production well, crew are obsessed with it. If Dumbledore is busy teaching at the school and he's getting involved somehow, then yeah, I could see. Yeah. Credence having a uh, visitor's day at Hogwarts. <laughs> so I had I had this thought while thinking of it uh, recently that Ezra Miller is kind of like um, this series, this film series, the Fantastic Beasts film series, Ivana Lynch character. Uh, he- hear me out here. If you watch him give these interviews that he gives, and if you uh, listen to what he's saying and the stories that he's telling from the set, you can really tell that he's sort of into it in a level that's above everyone else's. Like, I feel like the adult actors were, are all very passionate and you see them like laughing and loving and talking about their experiences. But Ezra, for instance, actually wore and demanded to wear 1920s era underwear um, for his role as Credence. This is not something you ever see in the film, obviously, but this is something that he did to get into character which I guess maybe 1920s underwear is uncomfortable or something. But, wow, um, Oscar I mean, for this guy. No wonder I mean, he looks so uncomfortable all the time. Yeah, yeah. This is, this, is the, this is the radish earring sort of thing. You know, and I think, they, <laughs> interestingly, the reason I push this so hard is because he also seems to have knowledge that nobody else has, and, and, and he seems to have knowledge that, for some reason, they keep letting him say. So on the Blu-ray mm-hmm. special features... He gives this insight into the obscurial, which is particularly relevant. Here's the quote from him. The truth is that he, Credence, is magical, and he's been repressing his magic. The forces of the universe come into a physical form, which is this obscurus, and that obscurus initially comes to the obscurial as a friend, trying to encourage with increasing severity to encourage this kid to allow their true identity and their power to run through them. This idea of this obscurus is that if you continue to suppress the truth of you, then it turns ugly. You can run, but it wouldn't be very fruitful. So the way he describes this, obscure, I mean, he's clearly not pulling this out of his uh, 1920s underwear here. I have a feeling that J.K. Rowling was very clear with him sort of about the character, about the motivations of the character, and he seems to have a deeper understanding. I mean, this sounds like the Obscurus originally is sort of like uh, like an imaginary friend sort of thing that comes to you and, and is trying to, like, convince you to channel your magic through them. It's crazy. 
I also think what you were kind of getting at is that he's a huge Harry Potter fan. Yeah. Getting ready for this role. Yeah. And there was a quote. I, I was just trying to find it while you're talking. I can't. But he had this really great line. I think it was at Comic-Con. Like, just about how excited he was. It, it when Oh, I know what he said. He was like, getting cast for this was like getting your Hogwarts letter. Because oh. he had always been a huge Harry Potter fan of the books and movies. And then he, he finally got this role. And he finally gets to be in the Wizarding World. So, yeah, like like Ivana Lynch, who is a huge Harry Potter fan, she found out about the Luna Lovegood casting call through MuggleNet. <laughs> yeah. Um, she, she uh, yeah, they're just both diehard Harry Potter, Potter, Harry Potter fans. I don't know if we ever j- mentioned this on the show, but now it feels like a good time to, to, to say it. When um, I was on the set for Order of the Phoenix, and that was Ivana Lynch's first movie, um, she told me that she was listening to MuggleCast one time on the set, and Emma Watson come, comes over her, to her and says, oh, what are you listening to? And, you know, Ivana's like, oh, I'm listening to MuggleCast, the Terry Potter podcast. And Emma Watson listened for a little bit with her. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. I love that and so And then much. she said, oh, this sucks. Why do you listen to this? Oh, that? yeah, yeah. Sure, sure, sure. <laughs> Well, uh, and hey, maybe she listens regularly. You don't know. Maybe, yeah. If yeah. Ivana did surprise us all in Chicago by wearing that shirt, right? She had one of the original Muggle Cast shirts. Yeah, we we she's... had made up the seven year anniversary shirts, and I asked her if she needed one. She says, "No, thanks. I'll bring my own." We didn't know what that meant. And then she showed up in the original like iPod Shadows shirt to the yeah, Muggle Cast great. panel. It's crazy. Yeah, she's she's a real Harry Potter fan, and and that showed through. Yeah, and getting back to credence hopefully um his love for harry potter will shine through as well in these future movies. yeah can we talk about what's ahead for him yeah well let's so here's a quote from ezra on uh credence just once more um that i thought was relevant he says there is cause and effect in all things in the world and the idea of someone who endures trauma and then has the tough choices to make about how that trauma is going to manifest, whether that wound will be a blessing or will be a curse, is, I think, a really potent subject. Hmm. Right? <laughs> no, it is. It, it is. It's very profound, very deep statement to make. And it, I have to imagine that it's leading somewhere as it relates to his character in future films. Yeah. So at the end, we do see him kind of disappear off into a wisp. We see one little piece of the Obscurus go up into the air. Yeah. And then we do also know that, I think it was David Heyman who said that they did film a scene of Credence boarding a boat. But it didn't even make the deleted scenes. So I guess they're just trying to keep it secret that he is still alive, which I guess is understandable. But that the cat's out of the bag at this point since he said they shot that scene. <laughs> right, um, it's weird he would say something about it and then it wouldn't show up anymore. Yeah, right. I was really looking forward to seeing that. Yeah. So, so I guess my question is, where where does he go from here? What is he going to, to? Like I said earlier, is he going to try to become a wizard now? Is he going to try to get what Graves Grindelwald promised him? And more importantly, how does he get to Europe if he's not on the boat? <laughs> Well, I I bet he took the boat. Yeah. Yeah, it just seems like it seems like where where I'm forgetting the timeline here. Where does Ariana fit into this in terms of her potentially like when does she die? What year was I, that? I feel as though 40s? I feel as though it's already happened. Mm. Yeah. I think it's safe to say that it that it's already happened and and that kind of led to my thinking about if in fact another living obscurus makes its way to Europe, makes its way to the UK, and there's the opportunity for Dumbledore to interact in some way, to play a positive role, given everything that's happened to his sister, that he may look to Credence as as that opportunity. Yeah, I think that makes sense. He could kind of redeem himself. Yeah. Uh, The mistakes he might think he made with ariana he can fix he can, he can redeem himself by applying what he learned there on credence but i do, I do and that question, though that's here about why couldn't grindelwald figure out that it was credence i know we touched on it a little bit earlier but for somebody as powerful as grindelwald to have that level of oversight you know, know that he had the the vision of seeing him standing next to Credence, 
what did that have been the the ultimate tell right there that if they were standing together next to each other unless that was just right. some line that he fed him that <laughs> credence could be the obscurus i know he's a little bit older uh, but still it, it seems like Maybe with everything else that he's dealing with, I get it. He's he's a convict who's on the run, who's trying to mask as the the, the head of uh, the Auras for Makusa. But you would think that he would be able to do a better job of of figuring it out. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's kind of like Dumbledore's innate ability to figure out what's going on in the cave, right? Because he sees, like, he feels, he senses magic. Um, I think it's a. I think it's a couple things. Graves' vision, first of all, which we don't know too much about it, is clearly just incomplete, uh, and he says as much. He says, "You know, I saw you," and it, maybe it's just his misreading of his own vision too that he doesn't realize immediately that Credence is the one he's looking for. But I think it's also possible that Credence was masking his magic, or or that by very nature, an obscurus is kind of a hidden thing where you wouldn't be able to walk mm. up to somebody and, and sense it. Um, the idea that Ezra is talking about where he says it's like a friend that comes to you, like I wonder just how much uh, an Obscurus is separate from the the hosts and how maybe if it's not active, you couldn't feel it or sense it or know it was there in a weird way. Kind of like how Snape is able to hoodwink Voldemort. I mean, Snape is the world's greatest double agent, the world's greatest, most gifted Occlumens, who's basically able to withstand being in such close proximity to Voldemort for so long while working against him. And it's just something that he does, because he does. So I'm wondering if Ezra's, or if uh, Creedence is sort of like a similar situation. I, maybe it's just the nature of the Obscurus itself as like a protective mechanism. Oh, yeah. Because if people can detect it, they would try and destroy it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I I like I like both of those points, uh, Juliana and and yours, Eric, about yeah. it's just not being clear. Um, I mean, even if you look at just how the Obscurus looks, it's a mess. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's not clear. You can't you can't you can't tell who it is by looking at that thing. So yeah, that's true. Yeah, and I, and I mean, credence as a uh, a product of society. You know, you have to believe that these young wizards are even though they're supposed to like generally remain a secret, so many of them do not end up being obs- developing like obscurials, right? Like Seraphina Pickery in, in uh, is very proud to point out that there haven't been many in century, haven't been any in centuries. Um, but ultimately credence is, you know, this happens because of the way, because of the harsh living conditions he's in. Um, I forget where I'm just going with that other than to say like, it's, it's supposed to, I think, point to larger instances in the wizarding world of, you know, larger morals of being yourself, of being true to yourself. And for that reason, I think it's safe to assume he'll be pretty mainstream of a character for, for movies to come. Yeah. I do think he will be redeemed, Credence. I do think he'll eventually be happy in this film series. Mm-hmm. Also, just looking at the f- <laughs> this is going to sound stupid, but... <laughs> We've spoken about this before. He has such a bad haircut. I feel like <laughs> by the end of this movie, he's going to be a good-looking guy with a normal haircut, and we'll be like, wow, <laughs> think back to Fantastic Beast 1, where he looked terrible. He's really come through in so many ways. Well, Mary Lou Get- just cuts all of those children's uh, ha- hair by putting the, uh, the bread bowl on uh, top of their head and cutting around. <laughs> right? Dumbledore's going to give him a queer wizard eye for the straight guy makeover. makeover? and Yeah. Yeah. It's going to yeah. be beautiful. Sure. I can't wait. <laughs> um, Go, Eric. So let's uh, – uh, yeah. So what? J- just going off of one of your points though, I think that Credence is just symbolic of what's going on in the larger wizarding community in America, right? They're all – they're not necessarily suppressing, but they are in hiding. They're not out in the public. They're not – you know. And, and this goes to really Grindelwald's ideology. So I think in some way – he is he's an example of of what the entire community is going through yeah was that too yeah deep? definitely which makes it surprising there aren't more yeah yeah i mean maybe there are maybe seraphine is lying through her teeth and is in denial maybe she has people who go and 
kind of stop that from happening when it when it sprouts. It's weird. Yeah. Yeah. Or maybe they just die before they become too much of a problem. Right. Which might sound sad, but... No, yeah, it does. <laughs> it does, but like a big, big boom. Um, you want to talk about name origins? Sure. All right, cool. Well, we have both. We have two. So we have Credence, his first name, and Barebone, his second name, which we'll do. Um, Credence is uh, an old French name. Uh, medieval Latin and Latin all agree uh, with French that Credence means faith, trust, believe. I believe in credence. I trust he is going to become a good person. I have faith. Uh, yes. The noun and verb versions of this word also mean the same thing. Uh, Katie put, uh, credence was very trusting of Graves and Grindelwald, which made him easy to manipulate. Definitely, definitely, definitely. And credence is actually one of many Puritan virtue names. Now, this article that she links to uh, is extremely long, but it's super interesting because, and we'll we'll have to link to it in the show notes. Uh, it talks about Puritan virtue names, what those were, uh, who chooses it, how they come about, and there's it's just a list of different names. So there's names like uh, please please God. There's names what God will, um, and then there's other ones like abstinence, reformation, uh, no merit. <laughs> Do uh, chastity uh, and modesty make that list as well? Let me see. Vanity, jolly, happy, verity. Verity is the name we've heard before in Harry Potter. I believe so. Um, oh, I see graves in here too. Chastity. Just kidding. Uh, <laughs> uh, many Puritan names. So it's just a number. It's sort of a history, a quick history of how Puritans chose their names, but it's definitely worth a read. Um, considering these these names. But J.K. Rowling is pulling from history. She's pulling from the Puritans to better set mm-hmm. the scene in a world that is believable. Um, so mad props for that. Um, it's an authentic Puritan name. So, Eric, uh, you made me think of mm. something when you said that Credence was very trusting of Graves Grindelwald, which made him easy to manipulate. Yeah. Do you think that's because he lacks a father figure? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. And is there Well, so he was naturally drawn to Graves because he is that father figure. And do you think there's a chance his father is still alive? That's a really good question, I guess. Is his birth mother yeah, still probably. alive? Well, his birth mother was killed. Okay. I think I think that's what um Mary Lou says. Uh, yeah. Um, he was put up for adoption, but we don't know why. I guess it could be because of she died. It could be a host of reasons that you're put up for adoption. Yeah. Maybe he was, um, conceived by the force. But we know, but, but, uh, we really don't know anything about his dad. We just know that his mother was a wizard. So maybe his dad was as well. Maybe his dad is Grindelwald. (laughs) <laughs> or or graves yeah anyway let's talk about the bare bones side of that yeah so the bare bones so there's actually a real guy um who was a muggle named barebone in real history and this was of course praise god barebone um praise god his, is hyphenated his name was that praise was god name? his name was praise god barebone <laughs> he lived from yeah the strangest name ever it's a puritan name it's on the list it checks out his <laughs> he lived from Consult 15 list, uh, yeah 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 <laughs> I should, she gave us the list he's on the list it checks out he he lived from 1598 to 1679 it's, it's actually quite a lot for uh the century that he's in he was an english uh an english leather seller preacher and fifth monarchist He's, according to Wikipedia, best known for giving his name to the Bare Bones Parliament of the English Commonwealth of 1653. Um, so this is a real-life dude who is sort of in the British um, government, and he has some books that he wrote, uh, and it just seems to be the most prominent Bare Bones. So uh, Katie found that for us, which I I'm going to name my first child, praise God. <laughs> but the, the last name Barebone is such a strange last name. I really would like to know why J.K. Rowling 
selected that. It just seems dirty it's to a me. Wizard porn name, if you didn't know. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> Barebone Productions. <laughs> <laughs> barebone books <laughs> why didn't newt get published under barebone books why did it have to be obscurus books yeah well <laughs> trying to be on the, a little more on the nose i guess um but there's actually a barebone in history in jk rowling's fictionalized version of the world oh uh as well which is mentioned on pottermore um during the history of magic in north america uh segment which you can find on pottermore it is revealed that Bartholomew Barebone, Bartholomew Barebone, was a nomad whose discovery of the American wizarding community, thanks to Dorcas Twelve Trees giving him vital information, led to the instatement of Rappaport's Law in the United States in 1790, completely segregating the magical and non-magical communities. Barebone was the descendant of scourers convinced to the reality of magic in society and devoted to destroying it. So... Bartholomew Barebone, which is, you know, Credence's ancestor, um, wanted to destroy magic and sort of rejected the idea of magic. So it's very much, you know, you can definitely see how that translates to Credence sort of hating himself or repressing the magic inside himself. Yeah. Hmm. So, so he's... What in relation to Mary Lou, I wonder? Uh, Yeah, well, considering that this Bartholomew Barebone was descended from Scourers, the Second Salemers are the same way. So, I mean, I would would guess it's more Mary Lou who's directly descended from this guy. Right. No, yeah, you know, I understand. That's what I meant. And sort of like they were probably all raised uh, the same way, like brought up from the ground up thinking that – Magic is unnatural, and you should root it out. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, that wraps up our discussion on Credence, unless anyone had any other thoughts. Can't I wait to uh, see, yeah, see more of them. Yeah, ex- exactly. Um, Lauren, who's listening live right now, says, You should have seen my husband's face when you guys said wizard porn name for Barebone. LOL. <laughs> well, hello to you and your husband. Glad you're listening live. Sorry, L- Lauren's husband. <laughs> so we have some voicemails here. We've got some good ones this week. Love Let's it. listen to this first one. Hello? Hello? <laughs> Cast? Hello? This is Rob, uh, this is Don Weaselton. Right, Don Weaselton. Mogulcast, are you there? Can you hear me? There's nobody on the line, Ron. It's voicemail. What? Really? Moguls can send their voices in the mail? That's brilliant. Why don't we have something like that? I believe it's called a Patronus. Oh, right. Well, anyway, Mogulcast, I love the show. Big fan and all, but it sounds like you're a little fuzzy on some of the facts. See, it was actually Harry's best friend, Ron, who really defeated you-know-who. Oh, please. No, really. Wait, hear me out. Hear me out. Ronald. Hermione. Baker. Can't you send on the phone? You're on my Sorry, Muggle. Are you still there? There's nobody there, Ron. Oh, right. <laughs> well, as I was saying... Ronald Weasley, that phone line is reserved for official business with the Muggle Prime Minister. Well, I was just... Ronald. Fine. Well, sorry, Muggle Cast. I've got to go. But before I do, Rose, Hugo, say hi to the Muggles. Hi, Muggles. <laughs> Look at that. How do I stop this damn nope. thing? <laughs> Give it here. Ron Weasley calling in. Not so good with voicemails, but um, <laughs> very well done. Thank you, Ron. That's yeah. That's an award I want to give all of the highest honors and awards to this voicemail. Well, hold on. The Dumbledore caller a couple months ago was yeah, was but they even well. had a Rose and Hugo here. Come on, oh, that's, that's true. amazing. Okay. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Ron. Wink, wink. Okay, the ne- <laughs> these next voicemails are all real people. Here we go. <laughs> Hi, I'm Bree from Indianapolis, Indiana. A longtime listener, first time caller. Um, I was listening back to the Queenie episode from a few weeks ago, and you brought up the point about how. If Queenie were more transparent about her legitimacy, that it could be advantageous to her career, even that she might advance through the ranks to, to be an or or to head a department, because those the Makuza would see her as 
a weapon or something they could use against others. And I just wanted to say that I disagreed. Um, I think that those in the Kuzu would find it off-putting. I'm a manager, have a team myself, and if, if I had an employee who could see what I was thinking or could sense my insecurities and my doubts, that I would be left very vulnerable. I don't think her superiors would appreciate that she could read their minds. I think that leaves them in a very, again, vulnerable position. Um, so I think it's probably a good thing that she's keeping her legitimacy under wraps. Um, it could be damaging to her career if she were open about it. I do not think her superiors would see it as a weapon. Love you guys. Listening to you for 10 years. Thanks. Bye. I thought that was an uh, interesting comment. Maybe maybe Queenie's kind of doomed <laughs> in terms of the job department. She might be sticking where she is for a while. But she can still read their minds whether or not she works for them. Right? Mm. Yeah. So you're saying she might do it secretly or something? Yeah. No, I, look, I think it's a great point that Bree makes, and it could definitely create a... a Difficult situation for her if she was to reveal that she was a Legilimens, but I'm sure there's a place within Makusa that she would be able to do her job effectively and efficiently. Maybe there are others like her out there. They, we just don't know. So, yeah, maybe like a team of them yeah, that could be exactly. like a Suicide Squad, but of Legilimens. Yeah, I mean, imagine. <laughs> but I mean, it would ability oh, yeah. and interrogation. You know, it, that would be amazing. Yeah, and especially um, where we're headed. We're headed to a very dark time, it seems like, both in the U.S. and abroad. So having somebody with that level of ability to read somebody's mind, I think, is a very, very powerful advantage to whomever decides to use it. I think that for now, her closest friends will be the only ones who know and find out, and she'll probably want it that way, because although she could be part of an elite team uh, within the government should she come out, I think it would be a lonely existence because most people, if they found out, would hold her at an arm's length. This next voicemail also responds to a recent discussion. Hey, MuggleCast. This is Lauren from Nashville. I've been a listener for about six months now and loving every minute of it, became a patron. And um, I wanted to talk about Clara's theory with Grindelwald having his magic maybe be taken away, um, mm. like what, oppor- or what does that open up for um, wizard prisons? I'm thinking more of like forced sterilization, Nazi type stuff. Um, that's where my mind went. If we're able to take a wizard's magic away, you know what? Where does that stop? So I do really like the theory that Grindelwald had his magic taken away. And I think it also could be that he just kind of gave up on being a villain and just, you know, is sitting rotting in jail. Um, But I would like to explore that a little bit more. You know, what would be the social ramifications in the wizarding world if that was a possibility to take away a wizard's powers? Um, Also wanted to say that I hope to see you guys at MuggleNet Live. I'm excited for that. Um, Booking my tickets right now. It's my birthday present to myself. Happy birthday, me. You guys have a great afternoon, and I'll talk to you later. Bye. Happy birthday, Lauren. Happy and birthday, Lauren. We'll see you at MuggleNet Live. Whoop, whoop. So I think um, having a wizard's magic taken away could be as hotly debated in the wizarding world as, say, the death penalty, because it is such an important aspect of a person. Yeah. To to lose. So, so maybe there are these long, drawn-out trials where it is debated, Maybe there are people who very strongly disagree with taking wizard's magic away for the same reason that Lauren's saying. Like, where does that stop? If you're in support of this, do you wonder, could it happen to me? Could yeah. I one day do something that has my magic taken away? Well, if, if it is possible, if this is something that is, that is able to be happened, I think it would only ever be used in the most extreme circumstances. I mean, Grindelwald is one of a kind. And after Voldemort, Grindelwald, I guess, is two of a kind. But... He really was the worst of the worst. We know that present day 1990s Harry Potter series time, the absolute worst of the worst, are just chucked in Azkaban where they can fairly easily escape due to the fact that Dementors are pretty much the only thing keeping them there. 
uh, keeping them subdued, keeping them from escaping. It's this idea that these Dementors, I mean, not to downplay it, they bring like this state of uh, depression and anxiety and make you relive all your worst, you know, sort of experiences and suck all the happiness out of you. I get it. I get it. But there aren't other wizards who are just like, you don't find out that other people have had their magic stripped. So if it ever happens or if it's something that can be done, let's assume it was only ever done to Grindelwald. And I think that that is something that, you know, Dumbledore would have um, been able to speak out about why it was necessary and convince the rest of the world that, or maybe it was never, you know, maybe it just wasn't publicized, but I think Dumbledore would think it was for the best. Maybe like, because Grindelwald just, would not be stopped otherwise. Right. Uh, I go back to the word defeated because clearly he didn't kill him. What does defeat entail? And and that's kind of where the idea of stripping him of his powers came from. And we know that he's being held in, in Nurmengard, which is a prison he himself built. And yeah. that's very reminiscent of concentration camps during World War II. We're led to believe that he captures people and, and holds them there. And I think somebody, it was either Andrew or, or Eric who brought it up on the last episode, that if he's being held in Nurmengard, you would think that he would know how to escape. He would have the ability to get out because he built the place. So yeah. if he doesn't have that ability, it makes me think that his magical ability has somehow been lessened or completely removed so that he, he doesn't have the ability to do that. So... I think the larger implication of that could be really, really disastrous for the larger community if, if people have the knowledge in terms of how to remove somebody's magical ability. I, I don't think it's... I don't know. Like we Maybe we get to a point in later Fantastic Beasts film where that is, in fact, what Grindelwald is doing. He's removing people's magical ability. He's imprisoning oh, them. Uh, it, would, it would fall in line, uh, I think, uh, with a lot of what transpired in, in the real world during World War II. So I, I think we may just have to wait and see, but I wouldn't be surprised. Also, just given Obscurials and what they represent, right, this manifestation of power, you're trying to ex extract that power out uh, from somebody so that they can almost be returned to normal uh, in a way. There's also a possibility that it was accidental, uh, that, that Grindelwald does lose his magical power, but it's through some kind of freak accident because he was experimenting with magic and what it means to be yeah. a wizard, and it backfired. I would think that would be more likely because if if a wizard could take someone else's power away, I feel like that's something Voldemort would have loved to use, like on Muggleborns, and then you don't have to worry about them wielding a right. wand. And mm. that would solve a lot of his issues. Yeah, good point. All right, Micah, this next voicemail is for you. Hi, MuggleCast. This is Andrew Skander. Uh, listening from San Jose, California. Uh, just wanted to say uh, I recently watched Puffs about a week ago in New York. Just got back from my vacation, got a chance to give you guys a call. Wanted to say thank you so much, especially to Micah, who uh, let us know about it. It was absolutely fantastic. A definite must-see if you're in New York. Uh, super funny. Um, absolutely amazing. So thanks again. Awesome. Look at that, Micah. You made someone's day. There you go. I'm glad they enjoyed it. <laughs> yeah. Andrew, now yeah. you're uh, you're on the East Coast. Are you going to make the uh, the trip to go see it? Yeah, I think so. I'm actually in New York right now, but I just didn't have time. I'm with somebody who's – it's his first time in New York. And so with all <laughs> – no disrespect to all the Puffs. Let's go see Puffs. <laughs> no, That's but, the first right. thing I <laughs> No, I, <laughs> I wanted to go with them to a Broadway show, and no offense to Puffs at all, but I, you know, I wanted to see something with the with the playbill. So we went and saw Kinky Boots. Forget about which is very good. <laughs> it's the same thing, basically. I mean, no, nah, it had Brendan Urie, and I felt I was like I was at a Panic at the Disco show. It was you great. Was say, oh, cool! Forget about the Empire State Building, Central Park, Statue of Liberty. <laughs> Go, Puffs. go see Puffs and Kinky Boots. Next time I'm here. No, I'm sure it's very good, and I, I really can't wait to see it. But next time I'm here, next time. Um, okay, one one more voicemail. This kind of looks back on 20 years. Hey, this is Trevor over in Oregon. Uh, Andrew, I used to live in Los Angeles, and then I moved back uh, to Oregon, so I can relate with that 
<laughs> Regardless, I was just listening to your latest podcast and the 20th anniversary. I was wondering if any of you guys remember uh, the characters before the movies. I, I know I had envisioned them looking slightly different, maybe more along the lines of the book covers. I remember completely uh, mispronouncing uh, Hermione's name. I think it was saying, like, Hermione for a long time. I, I, I just didn't know how to say her name. So I thought that was kind of funny. Anyway, uh, love you guys and a uh, long time listener. I know I need to stand up, sign up for Patreon. Um, I'm <laughs> slow. I'll, I'll do it sooner than later. <laughs> Bye. This, this, I like how people, like, he felt like he had to say that for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> otherwise um, we anyway, wouldn't play his voicemail <laughs> right yeah that's the only reason we played it because he promised he was going to sign up for patreon no um yeah I, I was the same way in terms of pronouncing hermione wrong i think i was re- reading it as hermione yeah or, or, yeah not hermione. yeah same yeah well there's that whole scene in goblet of fire where she's explaining it to crumb and that's very much a head nod or jk rowling's way of also explaining it to the worldwide audience yeah um, and also like Seamus, Seamus, Seamus. Yeah. I still don't know what like what the right way to pronounce that is. No, I like I, I'm I'm so jealous of people who got to read the books and understood what it was like before the movies were out. But I'm not that person. I saw the movie first, so the interesting like idea of of remember what characters looked like in your head and all of that before the movies came and presumably took over. That said, there are some characters I think that are still different in my head from you know the picture. Like who? Um, probably Lupin and Sirius. Honestly, I, mm. I see them a little differently. I don't I don't see my Sirius as as Gary Oldman or my Snape as uh, Alan Rickman necessarily. I think Snape and Snape too because he's just so much more actively evil in the in the books. You know, at times <laughs> the peaceful Alan Rickman quietness just doesn't serve. Mm-hmm. Yeah, at this point, I think my the, the movie, how they look in the movies, how's I imagine them when I'm reading the books, which isn't a problem for me. It never bothered me. But I think, uh, like Trevor, I think his name was the caller. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I was definitely imagining how they looked on the covers for starters. But this was also why, like, it kind of bothers me looking at the photos of the new Cursed Child cast because a year ago we got adjusted to these new people who are playing official Harry Potter roles. And then here we are one year later and we have to like re-accept what these characters look like. And it's hard for me to wrap my head around. So I'm trying to keep them out of the picture. Yeah. Yeah. I started reading the books in 05. So that was already when I think Half-Blood Prince was just being released and Order of the Phoenix was just being released in theaters. So from a character standpoint, it's really hard to say. I mean, that really only leaves books six and seven to have new characters pop up that maybe I would have a different vision on on what they would look like in the films or, or in my head. But I, I think, much like you, Andrew, the, the movies really influenced a lot of how I saw the characters when I was reading the books. But speaking of the books, the illustrated editions, when I look through those, I really, I'm like, wow, these are kind of how I pictured them in my head. Mm -hmm. And they do draw a little bit of influence from the movies, I believe. Like Harry looks like a young Dan Radcliffe. Yeah. All right. Yeah, he looks the most similar out of everybody. Mm Mm-hmm. All right. Well, uh, I think that does it for this week's episode. A couple of reminders. If you want to leave us a voicemail. One of these voicemails we're going to hold for next week. Uh, there's a hot new fan film that's kind of going viral online. Ooh. So we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit next week. Uh, but if you want to leave a voicemail, the number is 19203Muggle. 19203MUGGLE. It's an American number. You can also write into our P.O. Box, 404 North Lincoln Avenue, box number 144, Chicago IL 60618. And by the way, Slug Club member patrons, for those who signed up within that first month, they are going to be getting a sticker set soon. I have all the stickers. I have something to hold them in to get to everybody. So look (laughs) forward to those in the weeks ahead. 
And uh, like one of the callers mentioned, we're going to be at Mugwinet Live, right, Eric? Yeah, as as Lauren said, uh, we'll be there. It's September 1st of this year, which is the 19th anniversary. It's the 19 years later, the date of the Deathly Hallows epilogue. So we'll be inside the Wizarding World of Harry Potter, Universal Orlando in Florida, and it's going to be amazing. It's an entire evening uh, access, exclusive access to the, the park and to the shops and the Escape from Gringotts ride. We'll be able to get on the Hogwarts Express at Platform 9 and 3 quarters and take it to Hogsmeade and back. And we'll be joined by some of the actors uh, and actresses from the Harry Potter films, including Kristen Coulson, who played Tom Marvolo Riddle, uh, Chris Rankin, Percy Weasley, Luke Youngblood, who played Lee Jordan, as well as Ellie Darcy Alden, Rowan Gotobed, Ryan Turner, and Arthur Bowen, who were the children, uh, younger younger children in uh, the epilogue, as well as other areas. So, total fantastic evening to find out all about it. And to get our referral uh, link, go to the MuggleCast website. It's the first post on top. And you can use the code MuggleCast while booking your ticket to get $10 off your ticket order. Awesome. Micah and I will also be leading an expedition backstage at Universal Orlando where we'll, we will be scoping out any signs of a potential Wizarding World expansion. That is correct. This is not endorsed by Universal, <laughs> but we thought we'd have some fun and make for a good story on the show. And... Uh, well, we need to talk to the police to make sure we don't get arrested. But yeah, I was going to wonder how this works. Like, you, like Micah would lift the fence, you would sneak under it, and I would be somewhere in the park just talking to people to distract them. Yeah, right? You would be talking to well, the Eric police doesn't like to distract them. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Eric doesn't like to get in trouble. So, but Mike and I, we don't <laughs> mind. So we're gonna we're gonna put this together. Yeah, I'll distract the cops. I'll give them my theory on um, I don't know, some crazy Harry Potter theory on Barebone. Yeah, guys, what's police? What's the deal with Barebone? <laughs> Well, we're talking I, – I just assume we're talking about them next week, uh, the second Salemers in general, Mary Lou, Chastity, uh, and, and the rest. And we're going to um, send us your feedback, everybody, on the name Barebone and what you think it means. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> next week's episode uh, keep it kid-friendly. Filtered for uh, those that are 13 years of age. And it's going to get kicked off YouTube for, <laughs> for content. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Juliana, thanks so much for joining us. Hope you had a good time. I did. Thank you so much for having no me. No problem. Thank you for being on, in our slug club. Yeah. How long have of you been course. a MongoCast listener? Oh, God. Um, probably a solid, like, eight or nine years. Well, awesome. Awesome. It's been a while. Yeah. That is awesome. Well, thank you so much for being a longtime listener. And thanks, everybody at home, for listening. We'll see you next week for 324. I'm Andrew. I'm Eric. I'm Micah. And I'm Juliana. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.